When Leonard Skinner emerged onto the world stage in 1973, for the band, it was the result of their collective determination, having struggled to gain real recognition since they had formed eight years beforehand. And although they were immediately identified both in the music industry and the press as yet another act in the booming southern rock movement of the time, it soon became apparent that these Floridians were not only an entirely distinctive musical unit, but also one of the greatest rock bands in the world. They wanted to cash in on something, you know, that would be unique to them. You know, a southern redneck biker band. It was just such a crazy concept. But they were just audacious enough to make it work. Leonard Skinner was the showstopper. When I walked to the stage with Leonard Skinner, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was like the gladiators going into the arena. And the driving force of the band was Ronnie Van Zandt, a tough blue-collar brawler who led Skinner from the front line with his powerful stage presence, distinctive vocals, and his gritty, honest lyrics. Headstrong and domineering, his energy and vision propelled the group from its formation until its tragic end in 1977. From the minute I joined the band to the minute we had the plane crash, it was the hardest working band I've ever known of. That was due primarily to the work ethic of Ronnie Van Zandt. He was the true leader, writer, mentor of that band. Ronnie was spectacular. He, he just had a charisma all his own. And man, he grabbed my heart, hook, line, and sinker. I said, man, everything that comes out of his mouth is meaningful. Ronnie Van Zandt was a great songwriter. He was a terrific lyricist who and an observant person and a very smart guy and, and knew how to be ambiguous about stuff. He was very sharp. They put out six albums. 80, 90% of those songs are absolutely top rate. It's amazing. Ronnie Van Zandt was born in Jacksonville, Florida, in 1948, the eldest child of parents Lacey and Marion Van Zandt. At the time, this port city on the northeastern tip of Florida was undergoing rapid expansion, yet the Van Zandts settled away from the industrial and commercial center of downtown Jacksonville in the semi-rural area of the west side. Here, Ronnie grew up alongside his five siblings in a small family home close to the unspoiled beauty of the Cedar River, known to the locals as Cedar Creek. They weren't guided by any particular rules. Lacey Van Zandt was, home, was almost never there. The father, he was a, a hard-living, truck-driving man, and he was, he was very rarely home. And the mother, who everybody called Sis, was kind of a hands-off kind of parent. Ronnie was a barefoot country boy, you know, on the west side of Jacksonville. We lived down the street there at Mall Street, and me and Ronnie just became fishing buddies. We'd ride our bicycles down to Cedar Creek, I'd be on the handlebars, or he'd be on the handlebars, and we'd go down and take a croaker sack, and we'd catch mullet. We'd catch a sack full of mullet, bring them back and give them to everybody, some black folks on the other end of the street down there. We gave fish to everybody. Although fishing was the young Van Zandt's favored pastime during his childhood, the area surrounding the family home on Mole Street was a rough, working-class neighborhood, renamed Shantytown by its residents. And the quick-tempered Ronnie soon developed, in part through necessity, into one of the toughest kids on the block. The old saying, then and now even, is just the, the farther north you go in Florida, the more in the south you are. And when you were in Jacksonville, you were at the upper tip of Florida, and it was pretty bad, it was pretty bad country. Ronnie lived in a neighborhood that's where 12 o'clock noon on a summer day, you didn't want to be in that neighborhood, okay? And I lived about a quarter mile away, and the house is not much bigger in this room. But they were brick, and they were a whole level up from where the Ronnie's people were. They used to call us the rich folks. He lived in the roughest neighborhood they was. It was blue collar, and it was working class people, rednecks, you know. <laughs> Happy to be a redneck, you know. And <laughs> so uh, it was a great neighborhood back then. We called it the shanty town. They call it the bottom now. <laughs> the West Side was, everybody knew each other in the West Side. We played baseball together, we went fishing together, but we wanted to live here all our lives, but we knew we weren't going to 
really amount to much of anything here besides work. You worked for the railroad or you joined the Navy. That was pretty much it. Or you went to college to become a lawyer. And uh, starting a band just seemed to be a whole lot more fun. Despite being drawn to music from an early age, in particular country and the work of Merle Haggard, and having already developed an enthusiasm for singing, Van Zant's earliest ambitions were not artistic, yet they all involved breaking out of Shantytown. Growing up within walking distance from Jacksonville Speedway Park, his initial childhood aspiration was to become a champion stock car driver. Although with his enrollment in Robert E. Lee High School in 1961, his thoughts turned to more athletic pursuits. At Lee, early on, he wanted to play football. He wanted to be a running back. And he got play, and they did a scrimmage. And the first play from scrimmage, he got his ankle broken. And they put pins in it. That made him 4F, so he couldn't be drafted. Right before that, when Cassius Clay was in his heyday, before he turned over and changed his name to Muhammad Ali, Ronnie loved Cassius Clay, and he wanted to be a boxer. But boxer, and I wasn't there that day, and Estes Godwin, which lived over on Pangola, the other side of Woodcrest, Ronnie's side, boxed with Ronnie, and he just beat the hell out of Ronnie. So that changed Ronnie's mind about wanting to be a boxer. And you get your ass beat the first time you want to be somebody, you don't want to be that next day. The single event that caused Van Zandt to focus not on sport, but on music, occurred in 1965, when he and a friend attended a concert at the Jacksonville Coliseum. Despite the rich musical heritage of the South, it was a British band channeling this heritage into their own distinctive sound that provided the young Floridian with a clear roadmap for his future. The Rolling Stones played to a packed house on May the 8th, and their performance proved inspirational. Mick Jagger and the Stones is what inspired him. He liked music, country music. Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones is what put the shuffle in his feet and what put him into the, wanting to be a, in the music business. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. seen the reaction of the fans and the people, especially the girls. And the girls love the singers. They don't care much about the band, but they love that front man. And so Ronnie loved it. And he, he just had that reaction because, truthfully speaking, he wanted to get out of Shantytown. He hated it. He didn't bring nobody over to his house, uh, us close friends, but he didn't, if you wasn't a close friend, you didn't come over to Shantytown. In Ronnie's eyes, he wanted to be somebody. Mick Jagger did that dancing. Ronnie Van Zant come back, hey, I want to be, I want to be a rock and roll, and so that, he put that in his mind, and that was what guided him. Ronnie Van Zant had a goal. It didn't take Van Zant long to begin working towards this goal. Within weeks, he had joined young teenage group The Squires, and several years older than the other band members, he quickly took charge, renaming them Us. This would soon bring him into contact with rival band The Mods, which featured young guitarist Alan Collins and bassist Larry Steele. I first met Ronnie Van Zant in 1965. Alan and I had a band together called The Mods. Uh, we attended Lakeshore Junior High School together, as did Gary Rosington. And Alan and I's band had a battle of the bands coming up with another band. We had had a battle of the bands previously and we won. But now this band that we were uh, competing against, now their new lead singer was Ronnie Van Zant. Ronnie came over to Lakeshore Junior High School to kind of advance the gig. He was always calculating. He was like a field general. And he had requested through someone to meet with me. That was terrifying, you know? It was like, what? It just didn't sound good at all, you know? Uh, I knew of him, I knew the name. Everybody on the west side of Jacksonville knew the name because Ronnie had a, a fairly uh, big reputation as a street fighter. He was a, he was a tough guy. 
Uh, I was expecting to meet uh, Attila the Hunt, but he was very soft-spoken. He was very polite. He was uh, very intelligent. He knew what he wanted to do. He was as nice as he could be. Although Us won the contest, Van Zandt quickly decided that his bandmates lacked the skill and focus to match his own ambitions, and he began looking for a new outfit to front. Another group on the local high school circuit soon caught his attention. A recently formed three-piece band consisting of bassist Larry Youngstrom, guitarist Gary Rossington, and drummer Bob Burns. First was me and Larry. We were trying to do something. I said, Larry, we gotta get us, we gotta get us a guitar player. He said, I don't know none. I said, I do. Gary Rossington. Yes, I told Gary about it, and he said, sure, but he didn't have an amplifier. So we walked about two miles and got one. That's what we started practicing with. And we named the band Me, You, and Him. The way I met Ronnie, he knocked on my door one morning to say, right before school. I said, I don't want to fight you, man, you know? And he said, no, I ain't here to fight. He says, I'm a singer. I said, you're a singer? He said, yeah. I said, I'll be dang. I said, uh, I got a bass player and I had a guitar player. Why don't let's try to put something together? As they began to practice, however, this new as yet unnamed band quickly realized that something was missing from their sound. Enter guitarist Alan Collins. Alan was playing in a band called The Mods. He was their lead guitar player. We were practicing, we stopped, we said, look, it's just not full enough, you know? The sound's just not full enough. I said, we need another axe. Everybody said, yeah, where? Oh, they go, Alan Collins. And Gary just about thought about it at the same time. Peter didn't know Alan like I did. He was a distant, distant friend. I know Alan good, and he was out of my classes. So we, we approached him about it. They needed another guitar player. Ronnie was of the opinion that he could take two mediocre at best at that time. The truth is, Alan and Gary, neither one, they were both learning from each other. And Ronnie felt like if he could take the two of them and combine that energy and have them feed off of each other, that ultimately he could come up with, at the very least, a very good guitar player. And as it turned out, he knew exactly what he was talking about. As it turned out, you got two very good guitar players. With the band's lineup in place, after some rehearsing, they made their way onto the Jacksonville live circuit. Although as the majority of the members were still high school students, they were restricted to playing teen clubs and youth centers. Their set list almost exclusively made up of covers of songs by British invasion acts. This group, eventually named the Noble Five, was the first step in the journey toward Leonard Skinner. That band right there, if we jumped on a coffee tune, at first it was good and people were very impressed. Then they were saying, damn, that sounds good. And before we quit playing coffee tunes, and we played everywhere from the Doors and the Stones and the Beatles, a lot of rock and roll, some, some blues rock, uh, just on and on forever, good stuff. All the copy tunes, okay? And I'll bear, and I'll vow to say this. The band, Ronnie, me, Gary, Allen, and Larry probably had one of the best copy bands in the world. I mean, we knocked it out. People loved it. How good were they? Um, not really good. The Noble Five, when they were the Noble Five, they were playing other people's music and they were trying to put some of the original stuff, you know, trying to come up with something, but they were, your average young band, young musicians, you know, they didn't hit every note perfect. If the Noble Five still had to develop instrumental prowess and musical creativity, one thing it wasn't lacking was a commanding presence out front. From the get-go, Ronnie Van Zant was a striking and very singular lead singer. I would say the Noble Five was very average, but he knew his limitations and he, uh, he was very confident. Uh, he had a lot of stage presence, a lot of charisma. In the beginning, that, I think that's what got him by more than anything. At that time, he had not really come into his own as a singer. He had just recently made up his mind that that's what he wanted to do. Actually, to phrase it like Ronnie did to me, not what he wanted to do, what he had to do. 
and and he took it from there. He had, like I say, he had all the confidence in the world and he had his plan, his idea about how it was gonna all come together and he stuck to it. As a top 40 cover band, the Noble Five were competing in a crowded market. The coming of the Beatles, the Stones and the numerous other artists from across the Atlantic had seen an explosion of musical activity across the US and the major hub for the artists who had developed in the wake of this British invasion was California. Here, the members of the Birds, the Mamas and the Papas, and the Grateful Dead, among many others, were forging new sounds, their musicians dragging themselves out of the once dominant folk revival scene and into the brave new world suggested by the British acts. As distant as this all seemed to the young bands playing cover songs in the South, an act who on occasion played the same clubs as the Noble Five had made an attempt to break into this competitive world. Brothers Dwayne and Greg Ullman from Daytona Beach had initially begun playing on the Florida circuit in the ensemble The Escorts in 1964. The following year, they had become the Allman Joys, and they quickly rose to the top of the scene, playing venues not only in their home state, but across the South. In 1967, they became the Hourglass, and with industry support behind them, they relocated to Los Angeles. Yet despite several high-profile shows and two albums, they failed to make their mark. To musicians on the Florida circuit, however, including the ambitious young members of the Noble Five, they were an inspiration. As well as Greg Allman's powerful vocals and Dwayne Allman's technical virtuosity as a guitarist, the band wrote original material. We opened up for the Allman Brothers. Now, they were called the Hourglass back then, but it was the Allman Brothers. And uh, we were on first. We got in there. And Greg and, du and Greg and Dwayne just sat there and they said, look, you guys got a tremendously powerful band. He said, you, found, you sound great, but you'll never go anywhere till you uh, do your own stuff. He said, what you got to do is get you a place that to where you can practice seven days a week from morning to night. You know, and put a little recorder in there to keep place with the songs. So we did that for seven years. Inspired by Dwayne Ullman's advice, the band, having recently changed their name to The 1%, looked for a location in which they could work up new material and hone their musical skills through repetitious rehearsals. After exhausting the patience of family and friends, they eventually found a rundown cabin in the town of Russell, which they would call, over time, Hell House. And under Van Zandt's stern leadership, they began their slow metamorphosis into a major rock band. We practiced seven days a week from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. Tin roof, no air conditioning. It was hard work, it was hard work, uh, but we, we loved it, man. You know, we loved it. Ronnie was just realizing that we were going to have to work harder than everybody else to make it and his work ethic just went into overdrive. There was no time off. If you weren't playing a gig, you were rehearsing to play the next gig. And that created, you know, as a result of that, there was a huge transition. Uh, when they became 1%, though it was basically the same band, the whole attitude was completely different. This new vigor led 1% to quickly rise to the top of the local circuit. And in 1968, they began playing regularly at the recently opened Comic Book Club, the most vibrant venue in Jacksonville. As the band continued to develop, the following year, there was a significant shift in the music industry of the South. After the collapse of their band, The Hourglass, guitarist Dwayne Orman had worked as a session musician at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, immediately drawing the attention of Atlantic Records' Jerry Wexler. He, in turn, introduced Orman to an associate, Phil Walden, a manager from Macon, Georgia, who had previously represented R&B heavyweights Otis Redding and Al Green. So impressed was Walden by the young guitarist's talent, he encouraged Allman to form a new band and set up a record label, Capricorn, to release their output. In March 1969, the Allman Brothers Band was born, bringing together musicians from Floridian groups the 31st of February and the Second Coming, alongside Greg and Dwayne, and by April they had moved to Macon. Here, Walden set up a studio and began to build Capricorn, a record label that would become a beacon for talented young local acts playing rock music. 
Phil Walden totally believed that there was a lot of uh, creativity where we live, where we came from, and we experienced it. We experienced it in Alabama and in Macon, Georgia, where we, I'd gone to school and Phil grew up. Phil was the leader of this thinking, that, that, and his brother Alan joined in tune. You know, you've got great players around. Just look over your shoulder, turn around and look about. Phil got a call from Jerry Wexler about Dwayne Allman, and then he took action on that phone call. And Dwayne, uh, and Dwayne uh, was ready to make a move. It was very inspirational. It was the first inkling that we had that it could actually be done. It was Ronnie, in fact, that turned me on to Greg and Dwayne Allman. And we had known for years that they were the, the, the best around. If they didn't make it, we better start thinking about something else. And once they finally did, once Capricorn signed the Allman Brothers, we knew then we can do this too. The Almond Brothers opened the door for all of us. You know, they, they were the ones that went out there and paid the dues first. Little Richard had done a lot, Otis Redding had done a lot, Ray Charles had done a lot, James Brown had done a lot. But for a white band, they they were they were the pioneers. They were the they were the first ones out there that uh, really meant something, that played the Fillmores and and uh, really played original music. That was one thing they set the example for, was playing original music. The Allman Brothers immediately made an impact on the 1%. Their distinctive sonic approach quickly absorbed into the young Jacksonville band's sound. Yet it was a British group, traveling to Florida on a US tour, who would prove an even greater inspiration musically for the 1%. We followed the brothers a lot. The double leads kind of came in, you know, uh, Ronnie liked the way Greg sang. Hell, who didn't? <laughs> then we heard a band called uh, Free that was supposed to be coming to town, English band. And we heard them at a skating rink. And I'm telling you what right there, I think Free changed our band more than any band in this world. Paul Kossoff, Gary Rogers. It's identical to what Gary does. It was really beautiful, man. Beautiful freaking Simon Kirk on drums and Andy Frazier, the little hat, you know. For Ronnie Van Zant, the emergence of Free was almost as influential as his initial exposure to the Stones five years beforehand. Oh, 
Jones may have ignited something, but it was really Paul Rogers who was his great hero. He wanted to sing like Paul Rogers, and the inside joke, people like Al Cooper who produced his, the Skinner albums, was that on each one of those, there had to be a free song, a, a song in which Ronnie would try to sound like Paul Rogers. That was his beau ideal of what a rock and roll star would be. Here's, here's a guy in the deep south, and his hero is, you know, across the pond. His sights were very broad even then, and it was very canny because that wasn't being done back then in Jacksonville. Even the Allman Brothers didn't sing that kind of music. They were a great blues band, but they didn't emulate Paul Rogers or, or Mick Jagger. So this is a whole new thing that's coming with Skinner, and it's taken a little time, but it was on the way. Quickly assimilating these influences, holed up in the backwater isolation of Hell House, Van Zant and the band began developing their own material. Let's say Gary Ross and Alan went home and was just picking around on their guitars. We'd practice all day. They'd go home and clean up, play guitar. And I uh, practice. And well, they get into a groove with something really cool, you know, that's a whole measure, you know, and a whole measure so it could be a song. Even when a, a chorus of them sometime, a whole song right there. And if the band liked it, and if Ronnie could dig it and put some words to it, we'd keep it. Ronnie never wrote down one word to any song. If that don't freak y'all out, I don't know. Nobody's ever done that. And they ask him, uh, intricate songs, and they'd ask him, Ronnie, why don't you write it down? And he'd say, look, if it ain't worth remembering, it ain't no good. With a clutch of self-penned tracks now in their arsenal, in May 1969, the 1% were offered their first stab at recording. Local manager David Griffin, keen to capture the best of the up-and-coming Jacksonville acts on vinyl, booked both Van Zant's band and Larry Steele's new ensemble, Black Bear Angel, into Norm Vincent Studios to produce two promotional singles for Shade Tree Records. David Griffin was the one that set up the studio time for 1% and Black Bear Angel. My band wasted time, Ronnie's did not. Ronnie went in there, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He took advantage of the situation. They put down two songs, and the next thing you know, he had TV exposure, a lot of airplay and stuff like that. That was a, a big thing to their career. It's been so long since I've been gone. Lord, I'm tired now. Those were the days I enjoyed the most. Need all my friends. That was the first really professional one we just really grooved on, you know. Everybody liked it, the crowd, my friends, and we liked it. Yeah, that one was for a good time. Them songs brought us joy, you know. To me, I don't think they have a distinctive original sound on this first single. They sound kind of like a typical rock band of the day. Ronnie's voice is kind of Greg-ish. I'm sure that they were all well aware of Greg and Dwayne from Daytona Beach. And Gary told me that when he was 15, he was a massive Dickie Betts fan from Second Coming, from before the Allman Brothers. 
So, I mean, they had been steeped in that Florida thing already. But in uh, Alan Collins' solo in uh, Michelle, I hear there's a little bit of that Freebird thing already. Michelle is a lot like While My Guitar Gently Weeps, it's a little more sped up. And Alan Collins was a huge Johnny Winter fan. You really hear the Johnny Winter influence in his writing and his playing. Meet all my friends and Michelle. I don't think really sound all that original. They still sound fairly derivative. Based on those tracks, you wouldn't really say, this is a band that's going somewhere. I don't hear a, a lot of really original music. I hear a little bit of the Yardbirds. I hear Impact of Cream, other really British bands, but Roddy Van Zandt has a very distinctly Southern American country tinged voice. And you can look back in retrospect and hear the budding of something, but I don't think take it on their own. Those cuts sound like a band on the cusp of great originality. Yet week by week, the band were adding new songs to their set list. And before the limited release of this single, they changed their name once again. This time, it would be permanent. In a bastardization of the name of their high school gym teacher, they became Leonard Skinner. Stepping out onto the Jacksonville circuit with a fresh moniker and an ever expanding catalog, by the end of 1969, they had their first break. An audition for Alan Walden, the brother of Capricorn Records founder, Phil, who was looking to sign fresh talent. My brother and I had separated, and I had gone out and I auditioned 187 bands in one year. And you know how many bands that is a week, you know? Some of them by tape, some of them by video, some of them in person, you know? But I was invited to come down to Jacksonville, Florida and audition bands in a warehouse. And uh, a guy named Pat Armstrong, he had 13 bands lined up. And Leonard Skinner was the last band that played that day, you know? Alan Collins got out and flipped all over the floor and did all sort of stunts with the guitar, played behind his head and everything. I mean, they were, they were doing it. And, uh, but they didn't stop, they kept going and drive it like that. And by the time they finished with Freebird, man, I was blown away. I signed them to management, production, publishing, recording, uh, all of it. Alan Walden is probably one of the coolest people I have ever met. He just asked him, would you like uh, to be the manager? You know, he says, uh, I'll take a shot, will you? And I said, oh, he said, yeah, just try, just try. You know, both parties have something to gain, not to lose. With a manager now looking after their interests, the band's live schedule intensified over the following year, while Walden himself tried to secure Leonard Skinner's recording time at Muscle Shoals Sound. This studio, set up in Sheffield, Alabama, by the session musicians who had played alongside Dwayne Allman at Fame Studios in the late 1960s, was an emblem of the growing strength of the music industry in the South. As Phil Walden was building Capricorn and the Allman Brothers' first album was being released, these session musicians were recording the Rolling Stones in their isolated studio in rural Alabama. First trying to secure sessions for the close of 1970, Walden finally managed to lock down studio time in late June 1971 with guitarist-turned-producer Jimmy Johnson. Although for Ronnie Van Zant and his bandmates it was an invaluable opportunity to prove their talents, the sessions coincided with a number of unplanned personnel changes. Drummer Bob Burns left the band shortly before the recordings, while days in, bassist Larry Youngstrom was ejected from Skinner by manager Walden, and they were replaced temporarily by two musicians from fellow Florida band Blackfoot, Ricky Medlock and Gary T. Walker. They were also joined in the studio by their roadie, Billy Powell, who Ronnie had only recently discovered was a pianist of some talent. Despite these unexpected setbacks and new additions, the young Jacksonville musicians took to the studio remarkably well. Leonard Skinner, I didn't call them a natural talent band. They were a rehearsed talent band. Without rehearsals, they would have been a weak band. 
But these guys went to every Monday through Friday, they went to Hidden Hills every day. So they were well rehearsed when they came to Muscle Shows. All Jimmy and them had to do was get the balances and the tones and, and let these guys go to work, you know, and maybe suggest something about the arrangement, very little. Jimmy Johnson and Roger Hawkins and uh, those guys, Barry Beckett, all of them, they taught Leonard Skinner how to record, uh, how to really record, you know? And uh, did I think their recordings were good? I do, I think they were excellent recordings. With the recordings in place, Skinner hit the road hard for the remainder of 1971, playing further afield venues in Georgia and South Carolina, alongside their regular shows on their home turf. And in the new year, drummer Bob Burns returned to the band. Shortly afterwards, they brought in a new bassist, Leon Wilkerson, who years before had played alongside another Van Zandt, Ronnie's younger brother, Donnie, in high school band The Collegiates. After grueling rehearsals with this lineup at Hell House, in September 1972, Skinner returned to the studio in Alabama to record six new compositions. Although the final collection of Muscle Shoals tracks was passed around record companies following the completion of these sessions, they would not be heard by the public until 1978, when they were issued as the LP, Skinner's first and last. You're hearing the pieces in place, and, and they're, they're getting there, you know. It's most of the pictures there. Well, I think it's impressive. I think in a very short amount of time, they did develop their own sound in the song Down South Jukin, sort of this country honky-tonk, but rocked up thing. You don't really hear that in any of the Allman Brothers music at all, but Skinner is kind of defined by shit-kicking music, you know, for lack of another term. So I think you hear it right away. Great recordings. They were Juke and Bane, right up my alley. <laughs> I mean, this was right up my alley, man. I've been, I've been juking with Johnny Taylor, who's making love to your old lady, and all that, for years. And here's a, this white rock and roll band that's jamming, and they're getting it on, and the original songs. I want to on the street, drinking a bottle of booze, and got nothing to say, and don't got much to lose. Muscle Shoals was a great studio, but whoever recorded at Muscle Shoals needed a producer. The studio was fantastic. The acoustics are unbelievable, but they had to rely on Jimmy Johnson as the producer. And he's a great musician. He's a great, you know, owner of a studio, but he's not a great producer. He just gets it on tape. So, again, as if you know Skinner's music from later on, you can go back, listen to those Muscle Shoals tapes and hear all the great you know, stuff that would be, that would come out of it. But at the time, it just sounded like demos. Whatever the quality of the recordings, it was the band and their songs themselves that Alan Warden struggled to push. Armed with the Muscle Shoals album, he traveled to Los Angeles with Jimmy Johnson and arranged several meetings with record company executives. Yet the reaction was in most cases overwhelmingly negative. And after two years as their manager, Warden was running out of both money and options in his attempts to break the band. Those first three years were hard, hard, hard work. <laughs> Leonard Skinner was turned down by nine different major record companies. Turned down not, we like you guys, but the songs are weak. I'm talking about, we are not interested. <laughs> it's like, don't send us any more tapes. We don't want you. You know, and that, that just broke my heart. I'm sitting there listening to, to give me three steps, simple man. 
Free Bird, <laughs> you know. These are great songs, and we were being turned down. My own brother turned Leonard Skinner down, you know, in, in Grant's Lounge. He heard them there, and uh, I asked him afterwards what he thought. He thought, he said, your lead singer's too cocky. He can't sing, and the songs are weak, and they sound too much like Dahlman Brothers. And so I'm standing there listening to him, and he walks away, and I'm walking this way, and Ronnie stops me and says, what did he say, man? I said, nothing important. All of you major record companies said they sounded too much like the Almond Brothers. And you take a Leonard Skinner record and play it back to back to an Almond Brothers record and tell me what, what are they similar? They're southern bands. You know, they got a, a massive guitar lineup, great guitar work, you know. But, you know, what, what else do they have really in common, you know? <laughs> By late 1972, when Walden was attempting to attract major label interest, the Allman brothers were no longer simply a southern phenomenon. Despite the tragic death of their driving force, Dwayne Allman, with the release of their third album, Live at the Fillmore East in 1971, and Eat a Peach the following year, they had been propelled into the top flight both critically and commercially. The negative comparisons to the band were damaging for Skinner and Alan Walden began to actively distance himself and his group from both the Almonds and Capricorn. Yet although his brother Phil was uninterested in the Jacksonville act, his colleague and promoter, Alex Hodges, was far more intrigued by them. I called up Alan and I said, I want to know about your band. He says, well, they're probably not going to sign with you as a booking agent for two or three reasons. Uh, one, you represent the Almond Brothers band. Two, you're uh, in partnership with my brother, uh, and you're best friends with my brother, and uh, I'll think of a third reason, and uh, we're just not going to sign with you. And I said, Alan, who's the best agent you know? He said, you are. I said, so we got to talk. <laughs> I went to see them in Atlanta. Alan introduced me, saw the whole show. It was fantastic. I met him in a hotel, and I think Alan Collins probably just said, uh, so we might sign with you. We want two shows with the Allman Brothers Band, but we don't want you to be putting us on tour with the Allman Brothers Band. They do their thing, we do our thing. They're obviously enormously successful. Uh, and we just want to be sure, though, that we have, uh, you know, uh, play with them a few times. And uh, but you've got to figure out how to how to break us on the road and uh, give us our sense of independence on the road. It was an independent nature, uh, probably the most great bands, you know. And I felt that, saw that, and it was expressed in their words uh, when I first met them. But we hit it off. And it was great. Hodges respected Skinner's wish to only play on the same bill as the Allman Brothers on occasion, although towards the end of 1972, he did arrange the first of these shows in Macon, Georgia, in which the Jacksonville Ensemble held their own, supporting the Capricorn headliners on their home turf. Van Zant and his bandmates had been gaining the most traction as a live draw in Atlanta, however, where they had been booked to support Bob Seger and his band at the club The Headrest, and also managed to secure a residency at a more run-down venue called Finocchio's. It was here that they finally caught a break. When we got into Atlanta, there was a club called Pinocchio's. Fruit and nut bar all the way. More drug addicts than any other club in the whole city. Uh, I told Skinner guys, I said, if you can entertain these drug heads and these junkies, then you can entertain the world. Because some of these guys are coming in there and they need something and they ain't, don't want to hear nothing. And if you can entertain them, you can entertain the world, you know? And we stayed right there in Pinocchio's. We played there probably seven or eight times. The first time we came down and played for a week, we got laughed at. We got laughed at and they said, who in the hell are these hillbillies? What is this hillbilly stuff? You know, but then they give us another chance and they start catching on. Catching on, catching on, you know. And for, before we knew it, every time we packed Pinocchio's, which were whole 400, 500 people, we'd pack it out. Ain't nobody dancing. Ain't nobody up there at the bar getting drinks. All around the stage. They worked 
and they worked and they worked and they always were better. Every time you heard them, they got better. You knew there was something there, something was gonna happen. You could just see it. The first time I knew they were gonna make it big, I was with them in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a place called the Headrest and there were stages at each end of the dance floor. The other band played, they played a lot of top 40 stuff and everything, and all the kids were packed the dance floor and dance and everything. When they finished their set, Skinner played. One night, Skinner started the set with Simple Man, and all the people were still on the dance floor from the other band playing, and nobody left the dance floor. Nobody danced. They just stood there motionless and stared at them. And everybody in the club, when you looked around the club, was staring at them. And you could have, if not for the band, you could have heard a pin drop because everybody was tuned in to Leonard Skinner. And that was the first time I knew, yeah, these guys have got it. They're, they're gonna make it. The crucial figure who would recognize Skinner's potential and take them to the next level witnessed the band playing at Finocchio's during their second residency at the club in January 1973. Al Cooper had been involved in the music industry since his early teens, as first a musician and then songwriter, and in the mid to late 60s was a key figure on the East Coast scene, playing on notable sessions with Bob Dylan, Stephen Stills, The Rolling Stones and The Who, and forming the band Blood, Sweat and Tears. In 1972, he had temporarily relocated to Georgia to work with the Atlanta Rhythm Section at their newly opened studio in Doraville, Studio One. During his time off in Atlanta, he had by chance begun frequenting Funokios at the turn of 1973 and was there to witness Leonard Skinner in all their glory during their week-long residency. By the third night, he was joining them on stage and was eager to develop a working relationship with Van Zandt and his bandmates. It just sounded great. Just had a great sound. The thing that we had in common was we were both gigantic fans of the band Free. And that's what really made it work because they understood what was great about Free and I understood that and I heard the Free in them. Ronnie was not as great a singer as Paul Rogers, but he wrote those songs, and he had a sound. Paul Rogers was influenced by a lot of soul singers, and, and uh, Ronnie didn't have that voice, so he just did his thing, and he sounded like Ronnie. Cooper's response to this exposure to Skinner was incredibly committed. Within days, he decided to introduce their music to MCA Records, who allowed him to set up his own label, Sounds of the South, in order to represent Skinner and any other Southern acts he could discover. Although the terms of the contract that Cooper presented them with were poor, offering only a $9,000 advance, both Skinner and Alan Walden knew that as Capricorn had shown no interest, this was the only other horse in town. If Capricorn turned you down, you were through down there because there was nothing like it. I mean, in the South, uh, for, for white bands. Alan Walden really didn't have to do anything because there was really no choice. They'd been to Muscle Shoals and n nothing happened with that. I already had the makings of a deal with MCA. Al Cooper was a last resort. When nobody, when, when I knew that Leonard Skinner could not take another year of starving to death, when I knew that, I was ready to sign a deal with almost anybody at that point because it was going to mean the salvation of the band. Uh, if I'd have told them they were going to play bars for another uh, year and a half, two years, the band probably would have broke up. We were getting nowhere, and Ronnie called me one night and said, Someone broke into our van and took a lot of our stuff. We can't work, we can't put food on the table. We need an advance of $5,000. I said, uh, you want me to mail it or you want to come up and get it? And he said, uh, you can mail it and uh, you just bought yourself a band. 
when they got ready to sign their record deal with Sounds of the South, which was Al Cooper's label, had the recording contract laid out on the hood of my Ford pickup truck in the parking lot of the Macon Coliseum, <laughs> okay? And uh, I laid out all the contracts for him to sign, and Ronnie picks up the pen, and he, he looks at me, he says, Alan, what do you think of our record deal? My reply was, this is the worst piece of shit I've ever seen in my life. It's worse than the R&B contracts that we had. He says, what else we got? And I said, nothing. He said, give me that goddamn pen. Sign it. Having finally landed a recording contract, no matter the compromises this involved, the band set about preparing to record their debut album. Yet unexpectedly, this opportunity caused bassist Leon Wilkerson to question his commitment to Skinner, and he quit the band. With the recording sessions due to begin in March, rather than enlist a player from the Jacksonville pool, Ronnie Van Zant turned to an experienced musician who they had toured with three years beforehand as a support act, Californian guitarist Ed King. I think it was back in 1970, I was with a band called the Strawberry Alarm Clock. We had a number one record in 1967. In 1970, our old manager put together a bogus Strawberry Alarm Clock and started booking tours in the South, all these Southern colleges and stuff. We found out, we filed an injunction against him to stop him, and then we decided, well, we're bankrupt. Let's go ahead and do the tour ourselves. So our first gig was, I think we met down in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, the guys in Skinner were our opening band. The band was, was good, and Ronnie was spectacular. He, he just had a charisma all his own. And I told Ronnie later, I said, if you ever need another guitar player or bass player, you know, don't forget about me. I'd love to play with you. Leon got kind of scared of a record deal and uh, didn't really know if he wanted to be go through all the being famous routine or whatever was the work that followed the commitment. So he quit and went to work at an ice cream factory. And then uh, I joined the band on bass. It was a real shock to me. I had to really try and get used to it. I didn't really hear my bass playing with this band. For some reason, it was a different style and I was used to it. So I had an awkward time. In preparation for the upcoming studio sessions, King was thrust into Skinner's world, beginning with intensive rehearsals at Hell House, in which he was initiated into the band. Long before I joined the band, somebody came up in a boat late at night and stole a couple of amps. So every night somebody had to stay there, but my initiation for the first week is to spend every night there for a week. So here I am, the first night there. They all leave, I'm out with a bag of potato chips and a couple of Cokes, you know. And I have two, at least maybe 150 watt light bulbs hanging from the ceiling. And they stay on all night long because the sounds outside are unbelievable. I mean, one time an alligator came up on shore. The guy who owned the house way up in front had to come up with a rifle and shoot it in the head. Yeah. But that, that week was absolutely terrifying. Outside of this initiation, King also had more significant hurdles to overcome. Having already enjoyed chart success in the late 1960s, he had to adapt himself to Ronnie Van Zant's often oppressive leadership of the ensemble while also ingratiate himself with the rest of the band, in which he was the first non-Southerner. Ronnie and I had a disagreement where he told me he was the leader of the band. I said something with everybody around that I disagreed with. And he pulled me aside and made it extremely clear <laughs> that it was his band, and if I didn't like it, there was the door and it was going to be done his way. And I said, that's fine. I, I said, as long as I can just throw in my two cents. He said, that's okay. I just want you to understand this could be my way. No problem. I never had a problem with that. But if you want to get a glimpse of me integrating with a band, here it is. In the box set, there's a picture of us standing in front of Hell House. You got six guys on one side of the door and me on the other. And that says it all. It was difficult. And I was really, I was invited there by Ronnie, but the other guys didn't really want me there. On March the 27th, 1973, the band entered Studio One in Doraville to begin recording their debut album, with Ed King on board and ex-roadie Billy Powell, now a permanent member of the group on piano. Al Cooper himself decided to produce the record, and the peculiarities of a band he had only ever seen perform live were immediately revealed to him. When I started working with them, I discovered what really made them unique. There was no, not one 
moment of improvisation in their whole show. Every, when we recorded, every guitar solo they played was pre-written and memorized and never differed. The whole solo in Freebird, he could play it exactly the same every time he played it. And I'd never worked with anyone that pre-wrote guitar solos. It was uh, phenomenal. And although Ronnie Van Zant had a domineering approach to his fellow bandmates, with Al Cooper he relented, recognizing the producer's previous track record and experience, although others were less certain of his creative vision for the album. If I wanted to change something, they would fight me tooth and nail, to the point where uh, I was discussing something with Alan Collins, and he said, why don't you just leave us alone? And Ronnie came over and said, no, 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 no. He said, uh, uh, if he suggests 20 things over the course of this album and we use one of them, then that's one thing that made us better. And I'll suffer the other 19 to, to get that one thing. Al Cooper, you know, he's a dominating guy in the studio. He was very difficult. We had two different personalities and we clashed from the beginning to the end. And uh, I finally told him after I saw him at the 20th uh, reunion, I said, hey, Al Cooper, I have to say one thing. You certainly sweeten the skin of the sound. And that was the highest compliment I ever paid him. And, uh, and he did. That was exactly what he did to their sound. Al had a vision for the band and it was good, you know, nobody else did. And so he mixed the band a certain way, how he heard it. I mean, I could tell that it was fit for radio. But there was one special time when there was a real big clash, and that was when we thought the album was fully recorded, and Cooper called up and said, we need one more song. That was the time when Leon showed up and showed us Simple Man, showed me Simple Man. We worked it up. Within a couple of days, we went to Atlanta to record it. So we set up in the studio for Al, and we played it for him live. He says, I'm really sorry, you guys are not, we can't cut that, we're looking for something else. Mama told me when I was young who sat beside me my only son listen closely Ronnie asked Al to step outside, and Al drove a, I think it was an old Bentley. And uh, Ronnie opened the door to the Bentley, told Al to get in the car. Al gets in, Ronnie rolls down the window, shuts the door, and he sticks his head through the window, and he says, Al, uh, when we're done cutting it, we'll call you. So he sent Al on its way, and the rest of us were really kind of surprised. I mean, uh, you don't hear very many times in history when a a first album band tells their producer to get lost. Usually they get fired or something. But you want to talk about Al Cooper's passion. He'd put up with that, you know, where many others wouldn't. They'd say, <laughs> you know, you're gone, you know. With the album completed, Cooper's mind now turned to selling Leonard Skinner to as wide an audience as possible. And the first obstacle for the general public that he envisaged was the band's name itself. They were the second band to come into the club when we were in residence in Atlanta. And so up on the marquee, it said, Leinerd Skynerd. I went, what the hell is this? What is that? Leinerd Skynerd, what is that? And then, uh, you know, they introduced him. I said, oh, it's Leonard Skynerd. I see, I get it. I said, what a dumb way to do that. So I was saddled with that. The first thing that came to me is, like, well, let's put it to our advantage. It's like, what is, who is Leinerd Skynerd? And I thought everyone would mispronounce it. So I thought the best thing to do was to name the album, pronounced, and put that dictionary thing, Leonard Skynerd. 
like that. Released on August the 13th, 1973, Pronounced Leonard Skinner was an album that may never have existed, given the struggles the band had gone through in order to get it made. In the press, Cooper was declaring the band America's Rolling Stones, and while not an overnight success, the LP's reputation steadily grew, with Skinner slowly seeping into the heart of American culture across the following year. Pronounced Leonard Skinner is a very, very strong debut. It announces them from the very first notes of I Ain't the One as a unique entity, a self-confident entity. And it has a handful of songs on it that are rock and roll classics that stand up to this day. It has Tuesdays Gone, Give Me Three Steps, Free Bird. That was all there on their first record. They had a very distinct sound, a very distinct vision, and it's a very, very impressive debut. They had been working hard for a long time by that point, and you can hear it. To me, it's a phenomenally strong debut because they sound, they are a fully formed entity at this point. And you've got uh, uh, Give Me Three Steps, you've got Tuesday's Gone, which is a great pop song, like fantastic pop song. And then, I mean, Freebird, you know, I mean, it's their first real album. It has their, the biggest song they ever wrote on it. If you had to boil Leonard Skinner down to one song, it would have to be, to me, it would have to be Freebird. Freebird had developed quite a bit from the time they first recorded it as a demo until their first album. One of the things that had happened, I think, was a result of all these gigs they had played and gaining their confidence on stage and as a live band. It was also the addition of keyboard player Billy Powell and the elegant piano playing that he brought to that song and to the band in general. I think that, in many ways, Billy Powell was sort of the underrated secret weapon that Skinner had because as much as they could be a hard-hitting rock band, uh, as much as people think of them right off the bat as a two or even three at various stages, guitar band, which they certainly were, they also had this sort of very elegant, swinging piano playing of Billy Powell. Uh, and that can really be heard on Freebird. He added a tremendous amount uh, by having this beautiful piano intro rather than it just being a finger-picked guitar. And that's something else that set them apart. If I leave Tomorrow. Would you still remember me? For I must be traveling on now. You have this terrain, you know, you start on your journey with the song. It really draws you in with this slide guitar playing, this sort of haunting melody. And it's kind of hypnotic, you know, it's, it's kind of slow and mournful, it's like a ballad. And then, you know, a lot like 
Stairway to Heaven, which is the same thing, the song builds in intensity very gradually, you know? And it's that shift where you're going from this sort of gentle thing and then the power starting to come behind it and the tempo's picking up a little bit. This is true for both songs. You know, that's, there's a payoff there for the listener, you know, every time. When I heard Freebird for the first time, I thought I would like to see any kid between the ages of 12 and 21, when they hear this, they will just put their heads down and run into the nearest wall. I thought it was irresistible and I thought it was much more primitive than Whipping Post, which was the Allman's big song at the time. This was very simple, other than it starts slow and then it gets fast. But that's very simple too. And it, and it was phenomenal. Initial reaction to the LP in the music press saw lazy comparisons to the Allman Brothers, mirroring the record company's initial reception to the Muscle Shoals demos. And although these weren't necessarily negative, it continued to baffle the band themselves, along with the more perceptive critics who found no trouble in distinguishing the two bands. They were a blues band, and later on kind of a, a what, a fusion band? I mean, but they were, in their own way, they were virtuosos. We were not virtuosos. Because Ronnie liked to hear the same thing every night. He wanted, wanted to make sure the band sounded like the record. It was very scripted. There was no improvisation. We couldn't really, we're lousy improvisers. And that's okay. Still in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know. <laughs> the Allman Brothers are a jam band and the Leonard Skinner is a song band. That's the difference. Ronnie Van Zant was a great songwriter. That Dwayne Ullman was not a great songwriter. He wasn't. Great player, sure. Knew a great song when he heard it, damn right. But he wasn't a great songwriter. Uh, I mean, the, the, the good songwriter in that band was Dickie Betts, for better or worse. And he wasn't so great either. Ronnie Van Zant, on the other hand, I mean, what, they put out six albums? 80, 90% of those songs are absolutely top rate. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so, you know, when I heard the first album, I just knew something different was going on there. First, I noticed that Al Cooper's involved, not exactly a southerner. New York Jew from Queens, my stomping ground. And uh, he understands that this band is something special. And, uh, I mean, I liked the record when it came out, but... I'd say it was a little hard for me to hear through my own prejudices about Southerners exactly how good Van Zant was, but it didn't take long. Comparisons to the Almonds quickly diminished, however, once Van Zant and his band began doing the rounds for the music press. Unlike the Capricorn Act, these were clearly not Southern hippies, and the simmering aggression and redneck swagger of Leonard Skinner quickly marked them out as something totally distinct from any of their contemporaries. That was the beauty of late 60s, early 70s, the beginning of rock, the first de 10 years of rock, was be different, you know? Like, don't do everything you can to sound like yourselves. They had a band personality. It was a very strong personality, and it was distinct. They were bringing something that had never been heard before. It was redneck rock. They made redneck rock into an art. They made it into an idiom in itself, not just an offshoot of rockabilly or or country or something like that. It was totally indescribable, which was the reason they had such a hard time at the beginning getting that contract. But in the end, you really have to admire people like Al Cooper and the MCA people for, for recognizing that, because at the time, there was nothing like it. There'd never been anything like it. All of those guys, except for Ed King, uh, were rough and tough, but they portrayed that on stage, you know? I can remember uh, getting to New York, one of the early trade magazines came in to interview us and said, well, said, we heard y'all are from the Deep South and it might be referred to as rednecks. And Ronnie's answer was, hell yeah, damn right, where's your daughter? <laughs> he took the poor white trash 
image and turned it into something glamorous. He made people to feel proud that they were rednecks. And, and that, the Amish hadn't done that. The white Southern working class mentality and outlook was not only expressed through the band's image, but also in the lyrics of Ronnie Van Zant himself. And the album introduced a very singular, if underappreciated, writer into the rock world. I gotta say that working class was never something that I, as a very class conscious per person, actually thought of. I never thought of them as a proletarian band. I was wrong. It's a very good way to think about them. When you say Ronnie Van Zandt is a great songwriter, well, why is that? Well, one of the several reasons is that there were narrative details in his songs, that he observed life and wrote about it. Give Me Two Steps is a great song about being in a bar fight or not. Great, great song. I mean, because, you know, I mean, I mean, the wonderful song, I mean, there are a lot of songs about Saturday Night's So Right for Fighting, as Elton John did it, but very few good songs about how he doesn't actually want to fight and if he's, he's going to get the fuck out of there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, it's, I always thought that was, I loved that song, just because he had the guts to, to paint himself in that way. Ronnie Van Zant was the son of a truck driver. And and that's what he knew. And his experiences with women were, in, 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 lyrically, in some songs, hilarious to me. I'm trying to tell you I love you in each and every way. I'm trying to tell you I need you much more than just a piece of leg. I couldn't write that. A, it was from the heart. And, uh, and B, it was realer than most people had the nerve to write. Shortly after the recording of the album, the band's lineup shifted once again, with Leon Wilkerson coming back into the ensemble and Ed King moving from bass to guitar. Although apparently only a small change, it made an instant impact on the Skinhead sound. Ed was my favorite guitar player. And in the beginning, I didn't even know he played guitar. But first of all, he played a, a Fender guitar. So there was that. And B, he was a phenomenal guitar player. Now he had the opportunity to bring his knowledge into the band, and he was, you know, he wasn't a Southern guy. He was from California. So, so now they had this added to their pool of thought. Once I became the third guitarist in the band, integrating myself was so much easier than being a bass player. I mean, uh, pretty much I stayed out of the other guy's way. I found myself a third part. I try not to play too much, which I realize now I still overplayed some. But I thought we integrated very well, and the crowd loved it. But I think my really clean Stratocaster sound against their dirty Gibsons was a really beautiful contrast. And I didn't have to explain it to them. They just accepted it. Now playing his favored instrument, King immediately contributed to Skinner's material in a crucial manner. Before the first album had even been released, bringing his compositional skills into the band's daily Hell House rehearsals. How a typical day of rehearsal would go, we'd all show up at pretty much the same time, 
And Ronnie would say to any of the guitar players or whoever, uh, what do you got? And of course, uh, ideas were always flowing. You made sure you showed up rehearsal with something to work on. And if somebody had something good, you know, Ronnie would be sitting in the um, in his corner in the, this long sofa we had. And if he liked it, he'd just have his head in his hands and he'd go like this, keep going, keep going. And after a few minutes or so, 20 minutes, he might come up and, and sing a verse. I mean, Sweet Home Alabama didn't take longer than 20 minutes to write. I walked into rehearsal and Gary Rossington was playing this figure on the guitar. And I picked up this Strat that I had just bought, I don't know, a couple months before, and immediately bounced mine off of his, a totally different lick. Mine went dum 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 And Ronnie heard that and just locked into it. I could just see, I mean, you could tell when he locked into it. And 20 minutes uh, later, he sang up, grabbed a mic, and sang us the first verse. Once he started singing, I came up with the rest of it. Ronnie called me up and said, uh, I need a favor. I said, how much? He said, no, no, no. They said, we wrote a new song, and, and, and I love the way it sounds now. And, and I think it'll maybe it'll change in tempo or this and that, and I want to record it right now. I said, I don't have a problem with that. I said, so the only thing I would like to do is the night before we record, I like to go in a rehearsal studio and just listen to it and see if if I have anything I want to change in it before we record it. So I came down and they played uh, Sweet Home Alabama. And I thought, I, same thing, I thought, this is a number one record. Both Cooper and the band decided to hold Sweet Home Alabama in the reserves. And after their debut was released, Skinner headed straight out onto the road playing shows across the South. These dates, in modest venues, helped spread their name, yet had little wider impact. In November, however, they began a set of dates that would propel them into the spotlight as they embarked on a 13-show run opening for The Who on their 1973 Quadrophenia tour. Although Alan Walden and Alex Hodges handled the logistics of these shows, the opportunity itself occurred by chance after Al Cooper had been meeting executives at MCA's offices shortly before the release of Pronounced. I came out of the meeting and I bumped into Pete Townsend, who I knew. And, hey, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. I said, what are you doing? He says, well, he says, we're going to uh, tour the Quadrophenia album. I said, wow, that's great. He says, as a matter of fact, we're looking for an opening act. Do you know anyone that would be good? And I had just gotten a pressing or two of the first album. And so I had three of them with me. I said, take this home and play it. I said, this band would be phenomenal to open for you. And I wrote my phone number on, on the label because it's just a white label. So he called me the next day and said, you're right. This is great. This would be great. Let's do this. When we opened for The Who, we only had 30 minutes. We had eight inputs into the soundboard and 30 minutes. Plus we had to play Freebird, which is nine minutes. So we only got about maybe five songs, maybe six songs in, but made quite an impact. I said, look, this is the way we gotta do it. Don't give them a chance to boo you. Don't give them a chance to applaud you. No more than a three second delay between songs. I want it like that all the way. And buddy, Ronnie Van Zant delivered. We were more used to almost like a nightclub uh, uh, deal, you know, where you're, you just get tight with everybody sitting all around, you know. But you look down there, you know, 15,000 feet, and there's the first person. Uh, 
And Leon, way over there, on it, way up there, and I'm looking down at him. I hated it. I was nervous, but I overcame it, see? I overcame it, and I actually enjoyed turning them on. Because if I turn them on, here they come back. And I turn it on some more, here they come back. They were really, really nervous. But, but they were incredibly professional. And I got worried because they're going to play 20,000 seaters every night. And, you know, we played, you know, like Madison Square Garden, uh, Cobo Hall in Detroit. It just was, uh, it was, uh, and what must have that been like for them? And hanging out with the Who, you know, who were very generous with their time and drugs to the lads. So it was a wonderful experience and it broke them as an act. Riding high on the back of the Who shows, in the new year, the band returned to the studio to begin work on a second album. Now partly established, the financial necessities of staying in the South no longer applied, and for this LP, Al Cooper decided to bring the Jacksonville Boys into the heart of the entertainment world, booking sessions at the record plant in Los Angeles in January 1974. For the rising stars of what was becoming known as Southern Rock, it was a far cry from Doraville, Georgia. They were out recording a track together, and John Lennon came into the control room to ask me a question. I think he was in there for maybe 30 seconds. He went back out, and they stopped playing, and they said, was that John Lennon that just came in the booth? I said, yeah. And Ronnie said, uh, uh, we have to take a break for a few minutes. <laughs> Yet despite the prestigious, newly built studio that Cooper had chosen to record the album in, some band members weren't entirely convinced with the record plant or the material itself. To me, it uh, uh, was not as much fun as pronounced. It seemed, seemed like it was a whole lot harder work because those songs weren't, to me, as close to me as the songs on pronounced. The second helping was not as pleasant because of the environment. Really, Studio One in Doraville, Georgia is a great place to record. I don't even know if it's there anymore. But the ambient sound, um, the, f the familiarity we had with the board, the guys, uh, we, we missed it, missed it a lot. There's a difference between playing in a room where the floor is tiled or wood versus playing in a room that's a whole floor is carpeted and a record plant, the whole floor was carpeted. And just, it was just dead in there. To me, Second Helping, except for Sweet Home Alabama, which was recorded in Doraville, uh, Second Helping has that dead sound to it. Despite these reservations, upon its release in April 1974, Second Helping proved an enormous commercial success. Although, like pronounced, it took its time building up momentum, not aided by the failure of its lead single, Don't Ask Me No Questions, to chart. Yet the input of Ed King as a composer, the new three-pronged guitar lineup, and Ronnie Van Zant's continued development as a songwriter meant that over time, the album would make a significant impact. Leonard Skinner was very unique starting with Second Helping and having three guitar players. It's something that on paper can't work, but each of the guitarists, Ed King, Gary Rosington, and Alan Collins were very different and had their own strengths and understood that about each other. I think Second Helping stands up as a great album. It has Call Me the Breeze, it has the Ballad of Curtis Lowe. There was a depth to the music and to the singing and to everything about it that again made you feel things without quite understanding them, which is what the best music should do. Well, I used to wake the morning for the rooster crow, searching for soda bottles to get myself some dough. Run them down to the corner, down to the country store. 
cash them in and give my money to a man named Curtis Lowe. Alan Collins and Ronnie brought Curtis Lowe, the ballad of Curtis Lowe, to the band. And unlike any other song we'd written, that was written outside of our rehearsal space. It was written at home, you know, so they already brought it finished. And I arranged it, and I mean, it was an inspiration. Here's a song I didn't write that I really kind of grabbed onto and said, wow, this is, it's very, uh, very cool song. It's still one of my favorite Skinner songs. I think the band was definitely still growing when they did Second Helping. They were getting stronger and more confident. Ballad of Curtis Lowe is a great song, really cool, and sort of very distinctive. It gives Skinner this whole other part of their personality. And Call Me the Breeze is this boogie tune. I can hear a connection to like Bob Dylan watching the river flow or something like that, and just the blues. But the beat and the way they played and with the breaks and things sort of designed to show off the band arrangement-wise, it was definitely a step uh, in the next direction. You know, I think that this is creatively maybe the high point of the band. Ronnie Van Zant was showing an incredible ability to write songs that move people and also to have great taste when picking outside songwriters, which they didn't do a lot of, but they did with great effect when they did. And Call Me the Breeze, I think, is the perfect example. J.G. Cale is a great songwriter who also provided great songs for Eric Clapton. Just by pulling from him with the same sort of musical gusto and swagger and upbeat swing, it was, again, music that made you feel good. They took a very cool, laid-back, sort of swampy J.J. Uh, Kale song and turned it into an out-and-out, -out, you know, party rock anthem that gets everybody up and dancing and feeling good. Shortly after the album's release, the band played their biggest show to date, alongside the Allman Brothers Band at the Georgia Jam, in front of 61,000 fans in Atlanta. On the back of their country hit Ramblin' Man, at this time, Greg Ullman's ensemble were at the peak of their popularity, and other Capricorn acts, such as the Marshall Tucker Band and Wet Willie, had also begun to build a strong following. Despite being uncomfortable about being identified too closely with this wave of music now being dubbed Southern Rock, Skinnerd were canny enough to know that they had the songs to distinguish them from these contemporaries. They played with the Marshall Tucker Band on a lot of dates. They played with the Ullman Brothers on a few dates. They played with Charlie Daniels on some dates. Skinner got a bigger picture, actually, that we are who we are, and we're going to knock them dead and just give us that stage and give us our time, and we're going to go prove it. And, and if somebody can follow us, God bless them. But it wasn't really competitive. It was just a matter of self-assurance. Leonard Skinner was the showstopper. When I walked to the stage with Leonard Skinner, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was like the gladiators going into the arena. We're fixing to kill. We are going to blow the roof off of this place. And we did, <laughs> over and over and over again. Yet from the beginning of 1974, controversy had surrounded Skinner's live shows. While they were in part looking to distance themselves from the Southern rock boom, the new decision to use a Confederate flag as the band's onstage backdrop in many ways identified them as the quintessential Southern band, and the connotations of the flag itself raised serious questions. 
Not only did it represent the South's historical defense of slavery, it had also been subsequently appropriated by the Ku Klux Klan and a number of other white supremacist groups. They were not in favor of this at the beginning. According to them, okay, it was all MCA's doing. It was, uh, you know, the marketing people, the promotions people sat back in LA, New York, and they would think, they were saying, how are we gonna, how are we gonna present the, this band? You know, they come on stage, they sing about, you know, the, growing up in the deep south and, you know, all, all that goes along with that. How are we gonna present it? And they come up with, well, why don't we do the Confederate flag behind them? One of the worst decisions ever made, but also one of the best, because it really became identified with them, but it also forced them to have to explain. And they had some explaining to do, because mostly the critics who were based in New York and L.A., you know, people like Lester Bangs and, you know, Robert Christgau and people, very erudite men, Robert Hilburn, people like that. We're not so, we're not so quick to accept the Confederate flag as, a, as an innocent symbol of rock and roll. That was a symbol of slavery. That was a symbol of, of treason. That was a symbol of uh, half a million Americans dying, you know, in a war. As to whose decision it was, I think if the band didn't want to do it, they wouldn't have done it. As a natural thing to do, because the band didn't see it in the way that it was often interpreted, piece of history, you know. Um, I think that they kind of wanted to do it as uh, rebels, uh, as Southerners, as uh, not to relive the past in any stretch of the imagination. I don't think it was anything more than we grew up in the South, let's put the flag up there and go play for it. And unfortunately, it could be misunderstood. The idea of using a Confederate flag as a backdrop on stage came from the band. MCA would never have uh, uh, suggested that because, uh, you know, it's derisive and, and racially. Uh, but MCA didn't stop them from it either, nor I. That's what they wanted to do. That's what, that's what they felt in their hearts. That's, that's who they believed they were. That's who they were. So that's what they did. I always thought it, it, it was a rebel flag. Me personally, understand, I'm from Southern California. I'm as about as anti-slavery as you can get. And the flag being part of their heritage, I understand that too. You know, but just because we draped a flag back there doesn't mean that you know, we believed in slavery or anything. It's simply a rebel flag. And the band was surely rebels. This controversy was heightened with the release of Skinner's next single, Sweet Home Alabama, which was in part an anthem for the South, yet also a highly ambiguous statement from Ronnie Van Zandt. Not only did he address Neil Young in the lyrics, taking him to task for the song Southern Man and Alabama, in which Young had condemned white Southerners for their racism, he also made references to Alabama's segregationist governor, George Wallace. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. These lyrics would forever cast doubt over Van Zandt's own position on segregation. Yet the controversy in no way damaged the impact of the single itself, which not only provided the band with their first top 10 hit on the Billboard chart, but also broke them internationally. Ronnie was proud to be from the South. It's a uh, rallying cry for the South. That's really what Sweet Home Alabama is. But if they hadn't written this great song, really strong song, we wouldn't be talking about it today. Nobody would care. Sweet Home Alabama represents the growing confidence of young Southern men. It represents the growing confidence of the band. It represents some sort of swagger awash in America. It gave people a sort of wistful feeling of wanting something that was gone. And again, for some people, that represented wanting something that most of the world was happy was gone. But for many other people, it didn't represent that specifically at all. It just represented something good in some indefinable way. And it was a song that made you happy, made you stomp your feet, made you jump up out of your seat. 
and they just they just nailed it. They, they everything came together <laughs> into a perfect song for that band at that time. What I always thought was, it was a completely legitimate song. I never had any problem with that song. I'm not suggesting that the political logic of, of Sweet Home Alabama is anything special, but as a, simply as an expression of feeling, it seems completely legitimate. Basically, he's saying to Neil Young, who's after all a Canadian, don't you moralize at us. And I don't think that's a bad thing for somebody to say, he was moralizing. Uh, and I love Neil Young. Neil Young is one of my favorite artists in the whole history of this music. The Neil Young thing, of course, it was a repost to Neil Young for, for dumping on Southern, the Southern man who, you know, didn't do what their good book says. And yeah, he had every right to, Neil Young had every right to, every right to do a song like that. It was perfectly timed. And Ronnie had every uh, perfect right to, to do, you know, dispute it and stand up for Southern manhood. So that part of it was fine. But when you get into the governor in Birmingham, Birmingham, why did he choose Birmingham? It's not the capital of the state. Birmingham is the, is the place where the worst and bloodiest race riots happened in Alabama. So why is he choosing Birmingham? In Birmingham, they love the governor. Yeah, we know that, but they love him because they're, they're a bunch of racists. So was he, was he sending them up or was he endorsing them? We never knew. I put the background vocals on that uh, without discussing it with them. It was a very tough session because I use black women and they don't think Sweet Home Alabama. They think George Wallace. <laughs> What's he doing there? He's playing both ends against the middle. That's what he's doing. That boo, boo, boo thing. Who is booing? You know, he, he leaves it completely open. And I, as I, I really tried to pin him down on it. And he, he uh, you know, he made, yeah, he said with a fair amount of clarity that he did not agree with George Wallace's view of race. He said that with a fair amount of clarity. Did he therefore think that the appeal that George Wallace had to working class Southerners was altogether illegitimate when no other candidate was in any way trying to meet any of their interests and George Wallace was smart enough to do class stuff and in fact did some liberal stuff for working people in Alabama. He understands that there's something about George Wallace that he wants to celebrate and there's something about George Wallace that he wants to criticize. There's a certain kind of chip on shoulder, double dare you thing going on uh, where he wants to rile up and get uh, his, his core audience, the people he grew up with, um, and wants to say to uh, the rest of the rock audience, who he really would love to have on board and he wants to have buying his record, no, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. I'm going to do this now because I'm not simply going to be kissing ass here. It's a very, very complicated gesture that he brought off with more subtlety than I could, in the end, penetrate. And that speaks well of him. With a bona fide hit to propel them, Skinner continued touring the US into the summer. Yet despite their growing fame, their devotion to the chaotic routines of the rock and roll lifestyle was beginning to take its toll on the band and strained their relationship with manager Alan Walden. 
by the time the band got out there, they had been playing the bar so long that almost everybody in the band was alcoholic, myself included, you know. I needed to grasp real control of the band before they started fucking up the whole thing. I began to have to talk to hotel managers more and more and more about them tearing up hotels. Spent a good bit of time trying to convince the law officials not to arrest them all, okay? Finally, in St. Louis one night, they are checking into a hotel, and on the way in, checking in, they bust out the exit signs in the hallway. Well, the bellman calls down to the desk, and the desk comes up and says, hey, you guys have got to leave. They say, there ain't no problem. We got our manager to get another hotel. There was a convention in town. That was the last hotel that had any rooms, okay? So now they're mad with me because I can't get them a room in the middle of the night. I said, I'm going to tell you something. This just goes to show you why you shouldn't be doing this dumb shit. In August, the band members returned to Jacksonville and back in the relatively tranquil environment of their home turf, were able to recover from their excesses. Work soon began at Hell House on new material, however, where the creative partnership of Ed King and Ronnie Van Zandt continued to thrive. I came to rehearsal with this groove that Ronnie really liked. Actually, Ronnie contributed to the groove. It was the first time he ever did. He says, look, I like that and the verses. I want you to do this and then go back to what you had. Saturday Night Special. So I'm there rehearsing with the band, trying to teach them the groove, and Ronnie's over there in the corner. And after about 20 minutes, Ronnie comes up to me, not on the mic, which he usually did, sing for everybody. This is really, this is, this tore me up. He put, cupped his, my ear with his hand, and he sung to me. Two feet, they come up creeping like a black cat do, you know? And he sang the whole verse to me. A black cat do and two bodies laying naked. Creeper think he got nothing to lose, so he creeps into the south, unlocks the door. And as a man's reaching for his trousers, shoots him full of a 38 hole. Missed the Saturday night. I mean, I feel inspired now just thinking about it. I went right to the chorus, and then he wrote the chorus. So we had a verse and a chorus. Went go fishing, he went fishing, you know? Although Saturday Night Special developed quickly, the rehearsals also highlighted the limitations of drummer Bob Burns, who was struggling to recover from the heavy touring during the first half of the year. Although Ronnie Van Zant started looking for a temporary replacement, Burns himself sensed that his time with Skinner was coming to an end. I just got so burned out. Uh, what they were asking for, I just had had so much of it. And for so long, uh, I just told them to get another drummer that uh, you see the way I'm playing. And, uh, uh, I developed some some pretty serious illnesses and uh, to keep me where I couldn't play correctly. We tried to rehearse Saturday Night Special with him, but it just wasn't right. Leon and I went to Atlanta and auditioned Artemis Pyle, who was a good friend of the Marshall Tucker boys. And uh, Al Cooper dropped by and he said, um, you know that song you guys worked up, Saturday Night Special, why don't you work that up with Artemis because it's gonna be in this movie. Um, the Longest Yard. So we started working up with Artemis, and Al liked what he heard, so he says, go over to Studio One and record it. So we did. Artemis Pyle, who had previously worked with Charlie Daniels, proved a perfect replacement for Burns. Well, he was very good. I, I thought he was better than Bob. It was a good thing for the band. Musically, it was really a, a good thing for the band. Ronnie called me after talking to Charlie and after talking to the Caldwell brothers, Toy and Tommy, 
I think Charlie said something to the effect of, I know a guy that's crazy enough to be in your band, Ronnie. He, he's as crazy or crazier than all of you. And uh, to be the drummer of Skinner, you have to be a little crazy. Ed knew that Bob had to take a break and they needed somebody. So I was, I was, you know, Mr. Somebody, and I was thrilled. During this break in their touring schedule, Van Zandt also actively sought to sever the band's ties with Alan Walden, and another option was interested and available. British manager Peter Rudge, who had been overseeing The Who's affairs since 1971, was overawed by Skinner's shows opening the Quadrophenia tour, and had let Van Zandt know that if the nature of the band's relationship changed with Walden, he'd happily take his place. It was heartbreaking to me, but at the same time, it was like a big old concrete block falling off of my shoulder. I don't think Ronnie trusted Alan. Um, didn't think for where the band was headed that Alan was the right guy. Needed somebody bigger. And I think Peter Rudge, you know, not many people could get to Ronnie as far as uh, making an impression on him. Because Ronnie could... Uh, could suss you out pretty quick. I mean, real, real fast. He was very, very bright. But Peter Rudge, I think, put one over on him. Not that Peter Rudge was deceptive or anything, except Ronnie was really overwhelmed by Peter's accent, his demeanor, just Peter was the guy. And of course, he, Peter managed The Who and Tanya Tucker and The Stones, so why wouldn't he be, you know? Rudge took over shortly before Skinner were due to head to Europe for their first non-domestic tour to capitalize on their surging popularity overseas. The issue of a drummer now became pressing, as they still hadn't formally invited Artemis Pyle to take on the role full-time, and a flagging Bob Burns was reluctantly taken along for the shows. It would prove to be the end of his journey with the band. They were kind of phasing Bob out, but they had to go do a European tour, and there wasn't time to teach me the entire set. So for a, a little short time, just a, maybe two weeks, we were on the road and Bob and I played together, one little tour. And then they went to Paris, and Bob had a nervous breakdown. I don't think it was drugs. I don't think it was drugs. I think just uh, Bob was under a lot of pressure. There was times on stage where he would lose his place in songs. and. Um, none of us really got on Bob that much, but Ronnie surely did. I mean, if you messed up, Ronnie gets on you, get on you real bad. And in Europe, one night, one morning, early morning, we had a bus ride, and Ronnie got on Bob's case about the night before. Just really, really bad. And Bob lost it. It was a good tour. We played some damn good music. I kept the diary of it. But I got road fatigue, you know? I wasn't eating right. I wasn't sleeping right. I was dead skin and bones. I, mean, I wasn't eating. Uh, all that perverted sex and <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I don't think it was perverted back then, but later on in my older life, I could, I could see, wow, man, you know. My mind just blew a 50-amp fuse. I pushed so hard. I pushed, I, I pushed harder than a man should ever push himself. I snapped a 50-amp fuse. Had to go in the hospital. It was, it was sad, man. It was really sad. And I think it's just because the band was just overworked. I mean, we were under Peter's direction at that time. And uh, we hadn't really had much of a break the whole year. I mean, was, what happened with Bob in England? I could go into detail, but I'd really rather not. It's, uh, he just had a breakdown of all breakdowns. It was quite visible to everyone. It was so bad the hotel guy kicked us out, wouldn't let us come back. Uh, Actually, he threw the house cat out the window and killed it from five stories above. And, uh, and it got worse after that. 
Yeah, it was sad. I mean, it didn't have to happen. You know, Bob was had grown up with these guys. Uh, I think if we had just handled our tours better, uh, nobody saw, nobody who managed the band really saw any longevity. Of course, I guess how could you back then? It was just good. Go for all the money you can right now. The relentless nature of the Skinner schedule continued directly following the tour. Returning to the U.S. in late December 1975, by January the 6th, they were booked into Web 4 Studios in Atlanta to record a new album. Artemis Pyle had now been drafted in as a permanent replacement for Bob Burns, and Al Cooper was once again present as producer, despite MCA having recently bought out his Sounds of the South deal with the band. Yet the circumstances were totally foreign to all involved. With no time to compose new material during the previous year, Skinner had 21 days to both write and record the album. We were putting out a new album of new material every nine months. Bands don't do that today. They might take two or three years, you know, but they want a new product every nine months, which I thought was just way too, too much. I mean, Nothing Fancy was written and recorded in the studio. Up until this time, everything was written at Hell House, thoroughly rehearsed, maybe played once or twice in front of people, then taken in the studio. We had a month. We were in uh, Atlanta. I said, I'm going to go to uh, New York for two weeks. And I'm going to party my brains out. This is your time to do what you normally do, but you only have two weeks to do it. I came back, and it, and it was what I thought it would be, which is... It was almost done. This was a very tense making of a record. There was no fun involved for me whatsoever. Things changed where our relationship with Al is really out of control. There was times in the studio when other band members would bring all their friends by. We had all these people coming and going and lots of drugs and beer, which we never had at Hell House. I mean, it was at Hell House, man, it was all business, you know? Yeah, nothing fancy was just difficult, and Al was totally fed up, and understandably so. It was, uh, it was really hard for him because they were really, everybody was really putting it in his face. You know, he was a Yankee, and it really got tough for Al. With no one satisfied with the situation, the music itself suffered, yet the hectic schedule that had been imposed on the band was apparently inflexible. It not only proved detrimental to the album itself, but also spelt the end of Skinner's creative partnership with Cooper. At the last song of the record, Ronnie has a, a head cold that's so bad, you can just tell. And there are sections on it that needed to be redone, maybe expanded. It was just an unfinished record. Um, but yet, the minute it was over, I mean, the rest of the band had, was on a bus going to Detroit to start the tour the second it was over. Ronnie and I stayed back to finish that vocal on Whiskey Rock and Roller, then we both took a plane to Detroit to meet the band, and then this tour just started. And I remember vividly the, the last day. The, the tour bus was parked outside. It wasn't like they were going to go home and get ready to tour. The tour bus was there. They were going right out, and they were going to start touring. And I thought to myself, while all this was going on, I can't do this again. This is torture. And so I said to them, I would rather be your friend than be your producer from now on. And I think, you know, they'd had enough of me. Issued in late March 1975, the album Nothing Fancy peaked at number nine on the Billboard charts, the band's first top 10 album. Yet Van Zandt himself expressed his dissatisfaction with the end result. A cheating woman will make you crazy.
I think it was a more laid back record than the other two because uh, they, they felt comfortable in a way and they, and they were trying to be even more of themselves on, on that record. And also they'd changed as human beings over the course of uh, the three albums. I'll be cotton down on the dicks line. I work all day trying to make a dime. But that's all right, son. It's okay by me. Cause that's the way that it was meant to be. But Do they sound like a tired band? Well, the songs aren't as strong. Pronounced Leonard Skinner and, and Second Helping are really strong records. You know, they're like, you know, like bang out of the gate, you know, big time. No sophomore jinx with them at all. So their sophomore jinx kind of came with their next record. Although their musicianship as players hadn't dropped and their, um, ability to play like a great band hadn't changed. But, you know, compositionally, those songs didn't stand the test of time. Nothing Fancy was a disappointing record because it didn't have any of the classic songs that had defined Leonard Skinner's first two albums. It still sonically sounds pretty good. They're introducing some new elements with mandolin and other stringed instruments. And it has a couple of really solid songs, Saturday Night Special, uh, Whiskey Rock and Roller, and maybe most poignantly, Am I Losing, which really seems to be Ronnie reflecting on the band's state and his own state as they struggle with success and with all the problems that come with success. I recall when I used to come home, never had a dime. Lord, I always had a good time. And I recall drinking wine with one of my friends. It's an honest reflection of what happens now. Where am I now? Am I losing what made me great, what made me strong, what made me who I am? And I think that in itself is a powerful statement. During the recording of the album, newcomer Artemis Pyle was introduced into Skinner's inner sanctum, and the following few months would prove a baptism of fire for the drummer. If life on the road for the band had proven excessive on previous tours, under the management of Pete Rudge, their partying increased, and as they moved directly from the studio to the tour bus, following the Nothing Fancy sessions, the drink, drugs and punch-ups became a daily phenomenon once more. Yes, there were fights, but I've never been afraid of a fight. I can take a punch. I just immediately integrated into what I was doing in their world, you know, and which was a tour bus, an airplane, a stage. A tour bus, an airplane, a stage, you know, just a hotel room. Hotel room, tour bus, airplane, stage, studio. Studio, you know, just those five things just in a row all the time for three years. Back in those days, I enjoyed smoking weed. But the guys, they were hard on themselves. You can't burn the candle at both ends and expect to have your energy up all the time. I don't see how they functioned. Backstage at our concerts looked like an ABC store. There was cases of scotch and cases of vodka and Jack Daniels and cases of beer. And the promoter, you know, the promoter's always trying to make the band feel really good. And I never understood that. And they brought all this, you know, cartons and cartons of cigarettes. And the guys, were, and my boys thought that at every show, we played these big arenas and stadiums, all that stuff that was backstage, they were supposed to smoke and drink all of it then. And Ronnie Van Zant in particular was struggling to control his intake, which had a disturbing effect on his temperament. Never one to back down from conflict, alcohol not only fueled an inner rage, but led him to intimidate and often physically abuse his own bandmates. Ronnie was a maniac that whole tour, just a maniac, just night after night, something traumatic would happen. One time in Lake Charles, Louisiana, 
Ronnie had vowed, well, he had vowed two weeks before that to stop, stop drinking, and he did. It was, it was really, he was a lot better. I think he was miserable, but towards maybe the second week, he got a little bit better. But something snapped in Lake Charles two weeks later where he just went crazy, and he gathered everybody in a room. He ripped off his shirt. He grabbed a, a lamp on the nightstand and broke it against the nightstand, all this jagged glass hanging up, and he slammed me up against the wall and held it right to my neck. And he said, I don't want you to say a fucking word, okay? I no problem. Um, I can't remember really what his uh, gripe was. It just, y'all are stealing from me. That was one thing. Um, I can't really, it was just, well, it was just unjustified. It was stupid. As this run of 61 shows, aptly named the Torture Tour, continued across America, the camaraderie between the band members quickly began to break down, exacerbated by Van Zandt's routinely drunken and abusive behavior. Struggling with both the volatile atmosphere and his own substance abuse issues, Ed King decided midway through the tour that it was time to take his exit from the world of Skinnerd. Things started to fall apart around the middle of May. There were decisions just being made that everybody disagreed with. And I didn't think it would hurt to take a month off you know, go rest and uh, maybe write some more, get back in our little groove that we had. And uh, Ronnie, and I know people will disagree and say this is a lie and it's the absolute truth because I have no reason to, to lie. But Ronnie told, said to me in front of everybody, look, man, he said, I've, I've had it with the, all this bickering back and forth management and all this. You know, I just want to focus on what I do. He says, I'll, I'll let you, you make the decisions and, you know, just check it with me, but you deal with them, you know. So I did. I told Peter Rudge, I said, I, I want to cut this tour and uh, go home and rest, take at least maybe two weeks off and maybe two weeks writing and then resume it. Well, that was around the middle of May. And by the 26th of May, I was out of the band. And the only thing I can surmise is that sometime between then and the 26th of May, somebody got together with Ronnie and said, you know, you can't do this. You can't just stop a tour. Uh, because then the pressure started coming down on me to move me out. And then rather than move me out, I just decided, well, this isn't worth it. I'm just going to leave. One night during the making of Nothing Fancy, I was living in a hotel separate from wherever they were living. Ed came over one night, and he was complaining to me about how much money he had spent the last year on serious drugs, and that he didn't know how much longer he could stay in the band. So I wasn't totally surprised by that. And, and if that's why he left, I was glad he left. I had my share of drugs. Oh, yeah. And I'd had enough, too. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying I was perfect. No, by, by no means, you know. But I know when I left the band, I knew the band wasn't going to end well. I had no idea it would end like it did, but I knew it wasn't going to end well, and I really didn't want to be a part of it after that because my creativity at that point was shot. Really, there's just so much uh, friction. Just everybody needed a rest. People don't come to your hotel room crying saying they need a break if they just kidding, you know? I mean, there was some mental stuff going on. Now a man down, in July, the band rolled back into Florida to close the tour of the Jacksonville Coliseum. Despite the tensions within the group, the hotels damaged and the various run-ins with the police, their audiences had, for the most part, seen no knock-on effect on the shows themselves. Yet back in their own stomping ground, things finally fell apart. End of the 75 torture tour. Hometown boys come home, big deal, right? We get into town, a guy named Sidney Drashen, he's the promoter, he brings a big fat bag of pure cocaine. Well, everybody gets into it. Charlie Daniels opened the show, then we came out and played like four songs, and Ronnie collapsed. Charlie Daniels came out and jammed with us and tried to kind of save the, save the day but it just wasn't enough for the crowd because we didn't do that whole set. The crowd was like carnivores, you know, ah, ah, they wanted that music. 
And uh, we couldn't deliver that night. And so even doing Freebird, when we went to the fast part, I will never forget leaving the stage and looking back and seeing glass bottles bouncing off my drums. The amazing thing is how little Peter Rudge cared. And he's doing tons of cocaine himself. This is, this is no secret. And he's encouraging all this coke use. And it's just, looking back, I can't even fathom it, how that was. I mean, Alan Walden never would have done that. He never would have met them in, at an airport with coke for them to do or to take on a plane. They were kicked off planes. They were refused flights because when they would get drunk and stoned on a plane, it would, they would be a physical threat to the plane going down, ironically. So, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie, so the story goes, tried to throw a groupie out of a plane at 35,000 feet, tried to open the back, the door, and throw a guy out. These are guys in big, big trouble, making great music, but in big trouble, and nobody cared. Following a much-needed summer break, the band returned for further shows in August 75, including a number of dates supporting Peter Frampton. At the same time, with only nine months passed since they had completed Nothing Fancy, plans were already underway for Skinner to return to the studio to begin work on a fourth album. Without Al Cooper to oversee the recordings, Peter Rudge arranged for Van Zant and his bandmates to meet with legendary producer Tom Dowd, who had begun his career in jazz before moving into soul and then rock. Operating out of Criteria Studios in Miami, Dowd seemed an obvious choice, having been the producer behind the Allman Brothers Band's breakthrough albums. And in September, 300 miles south of their hometown, Skinner began recording Gimme Back My Bullets. They liked Dowd. How do you not like a guy with that, with that kind of record? You know, I mean, he's tremendous, a tremendous, pivotal figure in the, in the music industry. But the whole thing with Tom Dowd was as sort of a master plan to get Skinner to go to Atlantic Records. I mean, it was a whole thing. We're going to get it. We're going to move off MCA. You know, we're sick and tired of these guys. We're not getting paid enough. It was sort of a plan where it was going to be an incremental thing. They were gonna, the, the, the skids would be greased by having Tom Dowd do their album, and then they would just make a break completely. They respected Tom as like a father figure. Al Cooper was like one of the bros, you know, and Al should have been put on a little bit of a pedestal. Al should have been given a little bit more respect, but Tom Dowd, they called him Father Dowd. Tom liked to uh, rehearse parts and go over things. He was meticulous and had good ideas. And yes, Ed uh, was missed. I missed Ed, and, and Ronnie missed that guy that he wrote songs with. But the sessions were better uh, on Give Me Back My Bullets because we were a little more prepared. Uh, some songs had been written on the road and uh, on break. There was some material that had been looked at. <laughs> Completed in November 1975, Gimme Back My Bullets was rush released and out in the stores the following February. Yet there were signs that Skinner were losing their wider appeal. Although it was the first of their albums to chart in the UK, where they were steadily amassing a significant fan base, in the US it sold disappointingly, its lead single Double Trouble peaking at number 80 on the Billboard chart. Without Ed King's input as a songwriter or Al Cooper's slick production, for many it was a sign that the band were in a creative rut. The thing that I really contributed to those records was capturing the sound of the band and using the studio uh, to enhance it even further than it was. And the, and the best way to judge that is, is I did the first three albums and is to listen to the fourth album because, you know, it's devoid of anything that I did, which surprised me. It just made them sound like an average band, which they weren't. And I was disappointed. I remember getting the actual LP, and I, I didn't know how I was going to feel about it. And I took it out, put it on the turntable, and I, when I was putting the needle down, I said, knock me on my ass, please. So then I knew I wanted it to be good. 
I was very disappointed. And, and I felt bad for him. Life is so strange when it's changing, yes indeed. Well, I've seen the hard times and the pressure's been on me. But I keep on working like a working man do. And I got my act together, gonna walk all over you. Give me back my bullets. Put them back where they belong. Ain't fooling around, cause I've done had my fun. Ain't gonna see no more damage done. Give me back my bullets. Al Cooper had a certain style. And the early recordings of the band, he had full control of that freshness. When Tom came along, we were looking for some help. And I don't think Tom was able to capture that sound. It was nobody's fault. Um, but the facts were that the band was very popular expected to come out with some more material. Tom Dowd was the magic man, you know, Aretha Franklin, Live Cream, Derek and the Dominoes, the Allman Brothers. He had a track record, so Ronnie liked that. But capturing the magic from Pronounced, that boat had left, you know, had sailed, that Pronounced boat. You can't get that magic. But Tom, in his, way, in his own way, uh, emphasized the words and Ronnie Van Zant and made sure that those vocals were out there and that's what the band was about. Well, those business, business blues, never done so right by me. Some of the times I was unsung, but you just said so guilty. I think that Tom Dowd was probably a logical person to work with because he was clearly a great producer. He had the history with the Allman Brothers as well as with Cream, who are a very profound influence on Leonard Skinner. So I'm sure it all made sense. I'm sure that Tom worked his very hardest to get something out of them. But I think the biggest issue with that album was that the material just wasn't there. They really didn't have the songs. The loss of Ed King almost certainly had a deleterious impact on Leonard Skinner's songwriting. Their songwriting suffered, their creativity suffered, and at that point, it seemed like a fairly reasonable bet to think that Leonard Skinner was petering out and was not going to be a, a creative or commercial force for much longer. Yet Give Me Back My Bullets would prove divisive, with some band members, critics, and fans viewing it as an overlooked gem in Skinner's canon. I think Give Me Back My Bullets was one of their best albums. That's just my opinion. I always, me and Alan always agreed on that. I love that album. You know, of course, none of the rest of them were, it didn't sell well and nobody else was really satisfied with it, but I thought it was a great album. I feel like the, this record really did get a short shrift. You know, maybe because this isn't a big hit song on the record. I think that they are actually getting stronger as a band when I listen to this record now, today. Um, it's very, it's a very self-assured record. It's, the playing is great. It's a great record. Like, I mean, probably a better record than even fans might give it credit for just because it doesn't have a Freebird or a uh, Sweet Home Alabama or, you know, uh, Simple Man or like, you know, the, one of these tunes, these blockbuster tunes. So I think the record actually is, has, hasn't gotten its due. I think it's a better record than people think. And if a Skinner fan was sitting here, he would go, I know, you know, he would say, you don't have to tell me. If Give Me Back My Bullets was commercially a disappointment, as a live act, Skinner were losing none of their appeal. Just before the album's release, the band headed across the Atlantic for another European tour, returning to the US in March to embark on a three-month run of shows. 
Now a headlining act playing large venues, Ronnie Van Zant was keen to expand Skinner's live sound and brought female backing singers Leslie Hawkins, Deborah Jojo Billingsley, and Cassie Gaines into the fold, who would collectively be known as the Honkettes. It was a welcome addition to the stage show, and although the wider Southern rock movement had, by 1976, begun to wane, Leonard Skinner remained one of the top live draws in the world. We had three beautiful women that sang back up with us, the Honkettes, handpicked by Ronnie Van Zandt. Cassie was like a Broadway singer. She had a Broadway voice. Oh, you know, really strong. Leslie Hawkins was our soprano. She was our, our songbird. Jojo was the honky-tonk queen. She had that rough, baby, baby, you know, she, Ronnie liked that. And he liked the fact that the girls were all different and their blend was perfect. He handpicked them. Everybody thinks we're a southern band, where well, we are. And the crowds in the south are crazy. But man, when we play up in New York City and up, up north, they love the music. They were just as big of fans as the people in the south, as well as in UK, just as big of fans. When we went to Japan, they treated us like we were the Beatles, man. So anywhere we played, uh, the reception was always the same, very exuberant. Leonard Skinner was strengthened even further by the introduction of a new guitarist in May 1976, a position that Van Zandt had been considering filling ever since Ed King's departure. Upon her arrival in the band, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines had been recommending her younger brother, Steve. Yet this suggestion was initially dismissed by the band as they were looking for a higher profile player. In May, however, at a show in Kansas City, Van Zandt invited Steve Gaines to audition with Skinner at a live concert. And following further jams with the band, he proved that he was more than qualified to take on the role of third guitarist. He got out and played with us in front of about 80,000 people. Ronnie asked him that day, you know, be a part of the band. At the time Ed left the band, there was uh, everybody in the band had tremendous drug and alcohol um, uh, problems. And so it, I, I'm not blaming anybody. It wasn't Ed's fault. It wasn't Ronnie's fault. It was just the times. And Steve came at a great time. Steve's very mellow, laid-back intellect came in. That in itself helped us right the ship. We were a, a happy family, and everybody wanted to be cool for Steve, you know, because he was such a nice guy. You know, the band didn't want Steve to know that they were out of their mind, drunken maniacs, you know? <laughs> that was later. <laughs> that came later. Reinvigorated by the introduction of this young virtuoso, in July the band recorded a live album across three dates at Atlanta's Fox Theatre. After the rushed Nothing Fancy and the commercial disappointment of Give Me Back My Bullets, Skinner needed to re-establish their energy on record, and with One More From The Road, released in September 1976, they succeeded. Peaking in the top ten in the US and going platinum before the year was out, it restored their reputation. I remember when it came out, you know, it sounded phenomenal. Skinner was a live band. You know, they lived to play live. I mean, you could tell. That's their thing, you know. They're musicians, you know. I mean, they're going to thrive on an audience and ratcheting things up to an, another level. So, you know, Freebird Live is just phenomenal, you know. It's everything it should be. Leonard Skinner recorded one more from the road in July 1976. Steve Gaines had only been a member of the band for two months. As strong as the album is, as much as it was a great live album that really reestablished them and stands the test of time, I believe if it had been recorded two or three months later, it would have been quite a bit better. Steve Gaines was a fantastic guitar player who had unique ideas, jump-started the band, and surely gave a kick in the behind to Gary Rosington and Alan Collins because as a musician, if you add another person of that caliber into the mix, it, it has to do that. It, it just has to. It has to change the dynamics. And I think what you hear on this live album is the very beginnings of that happening. 
this confirmation of the band's status as one of the greatest live acts in the world continued in 1976 with a show in front of their biggest crowd to date. On August the 21st, almost two months after the Fox Theatre concerts were recorded, Skinner travelled to the UK to perform at the Nebworth Festival on a bill headlined by the band who had initially inspired Ronnie Van Zant to pursue music in the first place, the Rolling Stones. Not only did Skinner deliver a momentous set, they were considered by many to be the highlight of the event. Everybody who was there said the same thing. The Stones were horrible. They, they were barely coherent, they could barely stand up, and Skinner's set was what turned on the entire crowd, probably half a million people or whatever, 200,000, 300,000. It was, it was 100% cool, man. The Mirror said that we possess the energy of the day because of the energy of our set. The Stones came out two hours late and drunk. I actually made a statement that we blew the Stones off the stage. And nobody blows the Stones off the stage, of course. But I felt like we gave it a nice try, you know, it, it, as far as uh, going out and doing our show and, and our set and just standing on the music alone. I think standing on the music alone, we held our own. We're on stage in front of half a million people and Steve Gaines has taken a solo. And you can see Ronnie back up to him on this humongous stage. And you can see a smile and you can see that he's thinking to himself, man, am I a smart guy, man, for bringing this Steve Gaines dude into the band. You know, cause Steve's just shredding on this solo. And Ronnie's got this beautiful smile on his face. And Ronnie, you can see that moment that he just looks at Steve, and to me that says it all. Steve Gaines made a huge difference in the band. Although they were apparently riding high again, re-energized by Gaines and back in the charts with one more from the road, the band members' drink and drug problems were too far advanced for each of them to properly control. In September 76, both Alan Collins and Gary Rossington were involved in road accidents caused by their substance abuse issues. Rossington's injuries in particular causing six concerts to be cancelled. At this point, Van Zant acknowledged that they needed to change their ways, penning the song That Smell and turning to his old friend Gene Odom to step in and curb their excesses. He says, I want you to stay with me and be my bodyguard and take care of us. Get us off of the booze and alcohol, do that first, and then the drugs will be next. He said, I want you to straighten this band up. I want you to get us off of all this crap. And you're the only person who can do it because you're the only person that'll never do drugs or never smoke and never drink. And he was determined to get him off of it. And you can do a sociable drink or you can be an alcoholic. You know, he said, we want to get away from this and you're the only person that can do that for us. Management can't, nobody can do this, but somebody like you that's never going to hand us something and say, hey, you know. And so I would have got him off of it. I would have got him off of it to the point that they didn't have to live with it. You know, they might do it for a sociable thing, but they didn't have to bury their head in it, you know? And he wanted that. 1977 started well, Skinner heading off for successful tours, first in Japan and then the UK, before returning to Jacksonville in February to work up fresh material. Having recorded demos of these new compositions at a local studio, in April, the band transferred to Criteria Studios in Miami to work once again with producer Tom Dowd. Yet after cutting the majority of the album there, they were alerted by their live sound engineer, Kevin Elson, to the poor quality of the recordings, and Skinner abandoned both Tom Dowd and the studio. The stuff was sounding like crap, and it was thin and weak. We needed to go home, back to Studio One, where Sweet Home Alabama was recorded, Saturday Night Special, go back where we could get that good sound. So we trashed about $70,000 worth of material that we, we recorded at Criteria in Florida. We just threw it in the garbage can. 
Skinner would have to wait until July 1977 to re-record the album, their schedule once again demanding that they return to the road for two months of US shows. When they finally did reconvene, first at Studio One in Doraville and later at Muscle Shoals, working once again with Jimmy Johnson, Ronnie Van Zandt himself oversaw the album's completion. The band's radical decision to abandon the original recordings and start again from scratch paid dividends, however. Released in October 1977, Street Survivors proved a phenomenal return to form, with Steve Gaines not only injecting the proceedings with new vitality, but also contributing as both a songwriter and lead singer on one track. It would, however, sadly be the only studio album of Skinner's to which he was able to contribute. Street Survivor is an extremely strong album. I think it's clearly their best album since Second Helping. The band sounds completely revitalized by Steve Gaines, whose playing is all over the album. But in addition, Ronnie Van Zandt has written his best batch of songs since the beginning, perhaps inspired by Steve's presence. The fact that there was a tortured history to the recording of the album, that it was recorded once and put aside, is a fascinating footnote because it doesn't sound anything like that. It sounds easy and natural and hard driving and hard swinging. They had those songs under their thumbs. They don't sound like new songs. They don't sound tentative in the least. And it's an extremely strong album. And it's probably the Leonard Skinner album that I listen to the most. There's too much coke, too much smoke. Look what's going on inside you. Ooh, that smell. Can't you smell that smell? Ooh, that smell. The smell of death around you. That smell is an eerie song listened to with the knowledge of what was soon to come. And it shows that Ronnie Van Zant, similar to Am I Losing, was aware of the dangerous terrain that the band was walking on. And he understood that they were surrounded by a certain amount of doom and gloom and foreboding, and that things had to change or they wouldn't last long. Now they call you Prince Charming. Can't speak a word when you're full of blues Say you'll be all right come tomorrow But tomorrow might not be here for you He has this statement to make about Washington because, you know, he had to go see Washington in the hospital a few times when Washington almost died from a car accident, one of his eight million car accidents. And he was afraid it was going to ruin the band. So this was Ronnie's statement, you know, but it, you, this is not going to continue. I mean, I know I'm a hypocrite for saying this, and I'm, I'm including myself here in these lyrics. I'm, I'm singing to myself in a way here, but I'm telling you, Prince Charming, that you are not going to be able to continue to do this. Really proud of that album. From nothing fancy, uh, you know, like you know, give me back my bullets, uh, you know. Street Survivors, to me, was an indication of what we were we were gonna do. Street Survivor was 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 Steve and Ronnie and the band with a new spirit, and Steve is this great guitar player, man, just incredible. Ronnie got our our, our feet back on the ground with Street Survivors and the and the success of the live album and everything. We had two winners, and I think the next album would have been amazing, and I think that Ed King 
would have been asked to come back and write a song or play with us or perform with us. And Bob on double drums. Um, that's the vision that I had, that I thought things would just, what you know, would come around. And uh, then we had the plane crash and Ronnie was killed and and that's pretty definitive, you know, that's it. Days before the release of Street Survivors, Skinner had embarked on a major headline tour. And for this ambitious run of shows, manager Peter Rudge leased a private plane to transport the band and their crew. Eager to save on costs, however, the model he picked out for the group had seen better days. And although it had safely delivered them to their first four dates, the journey to the band's final ever show together in Greenville, South Carolina, had revealed just how unsafe their method of transport was. Yet just before 4 a.m. on the morning after this show, they reluctantly boarded the plane one final time, heading to Baton Rouge. They would never make their destination. We had shot a flame out of one of the engines coming into Greenville. And that's why we called our mechanic out of Dallas, Texas, and they were going to meet us in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and fix the plane. But we shouldn't have tried to make it from Greenville to Baton Rouge. That was the mistake. The plane had problems, obviously. and. Uh, we took off, and the rest is history. You know, we flew into the into the history books. Um, <sighs> excuse me. After we got on the plane and we got airborne, Ronnie gets up you know, to me because they were hollering for me to come back and play poker. And I'd run up to the cockpit and I was hearing that engine and I'd communicate with the pilots about that damn engine. And so um, Ronnie gets up and said, man, he said, I took two sleeping pills. I was up all night long, Gene. And I said, yeah, I heard, you know, and he says, uh, I got to get some sleep. started running out of fuel. I went to the cockpit. I played stewardess, told everybody to put out their cigarettes, conserve power, turn off lights, everything, and get pillows and prepare for impact. And I, I, I'm a pilot, you know, um, so I played stewardess. And um, I went back to the cockpit and the pilot and co-pilot, Walter McCreary and John Gray, they said, you better go back and strap yourself in. And they looked at me, and I could see they had fear in their eyes. Artemis went back to his seat, and I uh, grabbed Ronnie up off the floor. I snatched him up <clears throat> and shoved him between the island gate. I said, I said, man, the plane's crashing. He said, don't be messing. Gene, I said, I got to get some sleep, man. Don't be messing with me, man. I got to get some sleep. I said, the plane's crashing. So I strapped him in. He said, man, don't be messing with me. I think he might have unsnapped it before the, he, I know he did, actually. Um, and. I said, man, the plane's crashing. I'm not messing with you. Put your head down. And I actually slapped him. I said, man, I'm... And he went, I said, put your head down. And somebody said, trees. Suddenly, we came out of the clouds, the, the low ceiling, and we were right on the treetops. And I heard one guy go, trees, Clayton Johnson. He worked for Bill Graham. And he goes, trees. And then I could feel the trees brush against the belly of the plane, the fuselage. And the pilot and co-pilot, the last mistake they made was to put the landing gear down. And we almost cleared the trees. There was a, a field in front of us. We almost cleared those trees, but they'd put their landing gear down. Landing gear caught in the tops of the trees, tripped us into a 45 degree angle. We cut through the woods. I watched the, the right wing come off. Just an unbelievable crunch, impact, collision with the earth. And then it stopped and it was quiet. I was in Los Angeles. I saw it on the TV and I stayed up all night watching it. They didn't say who, who perished until the morning, you know, until the sun was up. And, that, and that's why I kept watching. I, I wanted to know I wanted to know that, like, as soon as possible. 
there sitting against the tree is a piece of an airplane wing torn away from the rest of the airplane. Lying down there at the base of the tree is the engine. And that back there, that twisted metal back there, is the fuselage of the plane. I was at my mother's and father's house, and the dad come, they almost knocked the doors down. People crying, and told, they told me what happened. I lost it. I said, oh God, who we lost? He killed me, man. He did kill me. Kill me. As the surviving band members and their crew were taken to various hospitals in the vicinity, it soon emerged that Skinner's latest recruit, Steve Gaines, his sister Cassie, and the band's assistant, Dean Kilpatrick, who had been working with them since 1969, had all been killed on impact. So too had Ronnie Van Zandt. Although the public would become aware of these details within days of the crash, for the survivors, it took longer for them to discover the tragic fate of their comrades. We went to five different hospitals. So the doctor came in to my room and he said, Artemis, I, I hear you've been asking who made it. And I said, yeah. And he said, are you ready? I said, yeah. And he said, Ronnie, Ronnie Van Zant was killed. And I said, I, I know, I knew that. And, uh, and then when he said Steve and Cassie, you know, that really hit me. Um, that hit hard. I, I didn't hear anything until uh, I got out of the hospital a month later. They didn't tell me Ronnie died or anything. I was going, when I got out, I said, keep me to go, to, go see Ronnie, go visit Ronnie, come on. So they started driving me, like, to Orange Park. And uh, they pulled into the cemetery. And, and I said, what the hell are y'all doing? And they said, we're taking this visit, Ronnie. He didn't make it. And that was, it was, that was horrible. That's when I realized that he didn't make it because they didn't tell me. I guess they didn't want me to know because my health was so banged up, you know. But it was a month later that I knew that he died and wh whoever else, you know, cause I didn't know, I, didn't, I thought everybody was fine, you know. The surviving members of Leonard Skinner jointly decided to dissolve the band in the wake of the tragedy, and for a decade pursued various musical projects both together and apart. In 1987, however, they reunited to perform a one-off tribute tour ten years after the fateful accident, bringing together former members Gary Rossington, Billy Powell, Leon Wilkerson, Artemis Pyle and Ed King, alongside Ronnie Van Zandt's younger brother Johnny on vocals and musical director Alan Collins, who was unable to play with the band on stage, having been left permanently paralysed by a car accident the previous year. So successful was this tour that the reconstituted Skinner decided to remain together. And although this has proven controversial, they have endured until the present day, albeit now with only one original member, guitarist Gary Rossington. Yet despite releasing new material and drawing large crowds to their shows, they have been dismissed by many as simply a tribute band, Ronnie Van Zant proving irreplaceable, even by his own brother. They suck. I think they're awful. <laughs> I take a great interest in how bad they are. I take a great interest in their Yahoo right-wing Fox News bullshit. Leonard Skinner dies with Ronnie Van Zant, period. Is it possible for a reunion band with somebody doing a Ronnie Van Zandt imitation singing his songs to do a decent concert? I suppose. That's that kind of, I'd rather listen to the records. They could never regroup that success that they had without him. He was the key factor to that band. He wrote all the songs. You take the authorship away and it's something else entirely. But you can make a lot of money. And that's what they do. I like a little bit of homegrown. She gets me stoned. Yeah, in a short dress. Yeah, I'm a mess. I like to get her all alone. She really turns me on. Yeah, in a bad beach, super sweet tea. Yeah, a little homegrown. They are acutely aware of 
what kind of dedicated fans they have. They're very thankful for it. They don't, from what I could see, they don't take it for granted one bit. And when I've seen them in recent times, they go out there and they want to give people the best possible show. We are gonna come out here and we're gonna rock the crap out of this place. And, and they do, and they do the whole thing, and they do the steps, they all get together, and they do the guitar moves, and they, they do the whole show. And they are more than happy to deliver that to the fans. They want to put on a great show every night. You know, it's really important to them. Despite the polarized opinion regarding the second incarnation of the band, and the various private and public disputes that have since occurred among the survivors of the 77 crash, the legacy of the first era of Leonard Skinner has remained untarnished. And although a wholly accurate account of their years together, from the mid-60s until the late 70s, will now never emerge due to the conflicting testimonies of those who lived through it, the music the band produced continues to find new listeners and inspire a new generation of musicians. And their departed driving force, Ronnie Van Zant, remains a remarkably singular talent in the history of rock music. His rugged, no-nonsense appeal still influential nearly 40 years after his tragic death. Ronnie Van Zant was a very unique frontman. He was incredibly dynamic without doing too much. He basically walked around, usually without shoes on, and held his microphone in the air. He was a commanding presence. That element of being a lead singer and frontman is hard for anyone to copy or emulate because it has to come from within. I think as a singer, Ronnie Van Zandt has been very influential, especially on country artists. Country music has become more and more rocked up and what we would have thought of in the mid-70s as country-tinged rock has become rock-tinged country. And I think Ronnie Van Zant's influence on Eric Church, Jason Aldean, and a whole generation, really, of country singers is profound, both vocally, musically, and in terms of stage presence and swagger. When music is new and it's fresh, and you capture that on record, it's always going to sound new and fresh. It's going to sound forever, it will. And it'll probably, like, you know, the old cliche about fine wine. It gets better over time. If it wasn't great music, we wouldn't be talking about it. So, you know, they found a way to be a distinctive band that has great music that people, you know, people are gonna remember those great songs forever. You know, I don't think there'll ever be another like Ronnie Van Zant, in my opinion. Man, everything that comes out of his mouth is meaningful. You could tell he was telling about his life. Everybody asks me, what was Ronnie, what was Ronnie like? What was he like? I say, you just take any six songs that Ronnie's written, any six, you pick them, any six, and that's him. That's his story.